Okay, so we're going to be talking about um, common extents uh, tendinopathies at the elbow, um, tennis elbow, or if you like, um, lateral epicondylitis, but I hate this term because it's completely wrong. Um, there's nothing inflamed about this, and the epicondyl isn't as involved except it's the attachment to the tendon. Um, anyway, we're going to be building this on the previous uh, video concerning segmental facilitation, reflex condition, and surprisingly flow. So if you haven't watched that, this one may be a little bit baffling. Okay, so it's a straightforward, no-nonsense um, diagnosis of common expense uh, tendinopathy. So we have pain on hand function, gripping, anything like that, holding stuff, but it's the hand, use of the hand, rather than the movement of the elbow or the neck or anything else. Um, if that's positive, then we can palpate the tendon for 10 minutes. You can, of course, do that first if you want to, um, but they're, they're, you're probably better off asking about what the, what makes the pain worth rather than just getting into poking at the patient. Anyway, we palpate the patient for 10 minutes. It's positive. We have pain on isometric wrist extension. It's positive, painful. We can then turn around and say this is almost certainly going to be a, um, a tendinopathy. There are, there's an exception to that, and we'll look at that in a second, but that's pretty much it. It's nice, straightforward. Now, as far as staging this as either an inflammatory condition or a um, degenerative condition, we can look at each one of these in turn. So um, first up, I haven't put it there, but pain on hand function will be an obligate loss. They won't be able to use their hand um, for many tasks. On palpation, we're looking at extreme severe tenderness, exquisite tenderness. Doesn't take a lot to feel this. You don't have to be poking around here. You just simply come onto it and they'll be yelling before you get anywhere really close to deep palpation. If you've got moderate tenderness, um, if this isn't all one where you have to go digging in, trying to find it, and yeah, there it is, there. And this is pretty much how they put it. Yes, that's the one there. Um, pain on the wrist extension. If this is painful weakness with a mild contraction, um, then um, it's almost certainly going to end up being a tendonitis. If it's uh, if there's no painful weakness uh, and you have to do a moderate to a strong contraction to elicit the patient's pain, then it's probably going to be a tendonitis. So this is fairly straightforward, um, and it's all based on two tests and a question really. Um, if you can find anything that this else is might be. Um, then there's a flaw with this essential illness script. But this is all predicated on accurate palpation of the tendon and not paying pain in anything else. If you don't palpate this properly, what you could be looking at, at the end of all this is actually a radiohumeral joint problem because you can be palpating that capsule, which is sensitive, and you'll get the same result. So this is predicated on accurate um, palpation. Now, if we look at the etiology of a tendonitis, this is either going to be a history of direct trauma, bang onto the tendon, um, or extreme overuse. Now, we're not talking about um, familiar overuse. Somebody's using their arm all the time. They do it all the time, and there's nothing unfamiliar about it. We're talking about severe, unfamiliar overuse. If the answer to that is yes, um, we can ask but, uh, about a history of um, recurrent arthritis joint inflammations anywhere else or other enthesitis. Um, it's unlikely to be this. Uh, if the answer to that is no, then we have local um, tendonitis caused by trauma, either um, one big off trauma or, or accumulated trauma. If the answer to the history of trauma is no, then you must be thinking of systemic diseases and you need to refer out because you have no idea what's causing this inflammation. This is pretty much the same as you get a, a swollen hot joint and there'd be no trauma, no reason for it. This is no different, really. Get this sorted out, make sure it's not a systemic problem, and then you can take them back in and treat them then. Um, causes and um, contributors to now um, tendinosis. So um, the contributors to this weakness, trophic malnutrition, or mechanical stressing. Um, so if uh, often these are these are not these clear cuts. Some of these belong to two different um, 
two different groups, but I've tried to divide them up as best I can. So let's look at weaknesses first. The weakness is either a neurological or neurophysiological. If it's neurological, it's going to be a radiculopathy, a neuropathy, or a multi crush problem. And that weakness can be um, conduction based problems, electrical conduction based problems, or fast axoplasmic flow compromise, which we'll talk a bit more down than in the bowl. Um, fast axoplasmic flow. Uh, will cause this weakness. Whether you include, the, include this in um, neurological weakness or neurophysiological weakness is, is up to you, but you definitely need to state which it is. Um, for me, I've moved it into this now. I think it's probably a neurological problem. Um, even though it's not electrical, it's still the nerve not conducting properly. The neurophysiological weaknesses are things about reflex inhibition, segmental um, facilitation, and internal overuse. And I'll come back to that when we start talking about an abducted ulna. But um, things can become overused. Tendons and muscles become overused when they're trying to stabilize an unstable joint or a um, or it's being put on a stress for too long a period. Um, and we'll look at that with an abducted ulna. But this is the neuro, this is the um, internal overuse idea. If it's weak, then it will overuse, it will try to work itself. So whatever the cause of weakness is, it will overwork trying to make up for that weakness. Um, trophic malnutrition, slow flow, axoplasmic flow loss, and mechanical issues, internal overuse, this is by hypermobility or instability protection where it's over, overworking to try and do all that. And you end up with degeneration of the, of the muscle end or the tendon. With the tennis elbow, you're looking at intercarpal hypermobility, um, which is caused by an abducted ulna. Um, and I'll come back to that, as I say, a little bit later on. But also wrist or elbow, probably more wrist than elbow, but wrist or elbow instability. Um, mechanical, so external overuse. You're just doing way too much for what your muscle can deal with. And gradually over time, it starts to degenerate and then it ends up uh, breaking down. Okay, so let's, how do we look for the etiology, the hidden etiology? Um, so we have a diagnosis of common extensive tendinosis. Um, it, it's just assuming we don't get a history of uh, severe unfamiliar overuse, which should result in a tendinitis rather than tendinosis anyway. So generally speaking, if there's a tendinosis and the patient is not doing something um, over a restricted period that then breaks down, um, then you're looking for something internal to trigger the whole thing off. So you can look for mechanical um, issues that's likely to cause some of these problems. So in the cervical spine, we can look at passive quadrant testing. These are quick screening tests, um, <coughs> which have to be sensitive, but not specific. So in the cervical spine, for that to affect the elbow, this is either gonna be um, a radiculopathy, yeah, sort of a hidden radiculopathy, or it's going to be a segment for So we can look for pain by doing passive quadrants. So we move them into these positions and see if we can reproduce pain in the neck, not in the arm, but in the neck. If that's the case, um, then we can start looking at the neck in more detail by palpating for muscle tone and so on. And we can look through the quadrant then, if we think of segmental facilitation, we can look through the whole quadrant then for weaknesses. Difficult to do um, muscle testing in the neck when it's painful, but we can move on down. Shoulder and elbow, we can do these quadrants in the shoulder and elbow. All of these quadrants which um, we all get in the class. Um, and again, we're looking for dis disturbed ovoids of motion, um, hypo or hypermobility or instability, and also looking at reproduction of pain. And then the rest we can do a test, it's called fanning and folding, where you simply palpate the bones and you um, part, uh, flex and extend the wrist until the bones separate and close up as they should do. So we can look for hypomobility now or pain. So any of this might talk to us about instability in the wrist, for example, fanning and folding, and for hypomobility in the wrist where you're not getting the movement that you're expecting to get. Um, and for the segmental facilitator in the cervical spine, as we said, we can look specifically for segmental facilitator. We found pain, um, but we can look for paravertebral scratch test positives, 
multifidus tone changes, that is hypertonus, and then we can wobble somewhere else, not around the elbow, because we know that if that's painful, that's going to produce segmental facilitation, but we can wobble the, the um, elbow, or we can wobble the neck, but we're going to see if we can reduce the effects of segmental facilitation there. Shoulder and um, elbow, we can look for segmental facilitation, strength and tone look changes, and the same thing in the wrist. Um, we can look for strength and tone change. The problem you've got in the wrist there is if you're trying to test extension and you've got pain at the elbow, you're not going to be able to have any real um, or something of satisfaction test in the elbow, knowing that it is weak rather than painful and weak. Um, but we can wobble the wrist and see if we can get rid of those segmental facilitation changes. Um, which will bring us on to an abductor ulna. And this is a, a big cause of tennis elbow. Um, so we need to look at the ulna, ulnohumeral joint. Um, now, the PPMs here, we're going to treat this, we talked about this, we're going to treat this as it's got two degrees of freedom, flexion extension being one and abdominal adduction being the other. So the PPMs will be um, flexion and extension plus ab have an adapter. In this case, you only actually need to test flexion, full range flexion, which is flexion supination, and also adduction to see if they're hypomobile. So the quadrant you're looking at is this. So it's full flexion and supination. Um, that's going to be limited. But they're also, the supination is going to be limited, um, and usually quite obviously so as well. Flexion is going to be limited, but it's mostly about the end field of flexion rather than the range. Just the last bit of range it's lost. Um, the arthrokinematic test for flexion, we don't test because it's not really a flexion loss. So doing glides here is not going to help us. But we need to do a medial glide for adduction, and that will be lost if it's, um, if it's an abductor. We need to look at the wrist as well, um, because that abducted wrist, and you'll get more reason for this on the class, the abducted wrist is caused because the carpals are shifted only by the radius as the elbow abducts. So everything's shifted uh, only, so you can't get um, radial deviation, which limits uh, power extension. So your power position for the wrist when you're gripping is basically extension of radial deviation, and you can't get that. So um, and this is my feeling as to what causes the tennis elbow. It's not a length tension change in relationship with these muscles, because I, I really can't see that happening. Um, the, the change in length tension in the neutral position is, is nothing, because uh, it's nowhere near it. It's hypertonus, but it doesn't change that length really in the neutral position. And you don't work the wrist in neutral position. It's a weakness, and it's, um, it's caused by reflex inhibition in the wrist, but also by. Um, by the fact that you can't get this wrist up. So now the muscle starts to overuse and overuse. So it's trying to get that position that it can't reach. So you get negative feedback from the proprioceptors of the wrist. So the muscle's overworking. So you get a combination of reflex inhibition weakness plus overworking of the muscle, and you end up with the it breaking down. So the PPM for the wrist is um, extension of radial deviation, and the PAM you'll find that all of the glides between the carpals are normal because there isn't anything intrinsic in the wrist that's stopping the movement. So the glides there become normal. So this is a quick introduction to how you use um, reflex inhibition, axoplasmic flow, and so on. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot to talk about axoplasmic flow, so we're not going to do it now because we don't want to remake this. Axoplasmic flow loss will come from the neck. Um, and oh, probably uh, it's, it's a radial nerve and there's not many other places where this gets blocked except near the elbow itself. So um, you can't pick up slow flow, so you're going to have to find weakness in that segment um, to pick up fast flow loss. But you end up with trophic malnutrition degeneration of the tendon again. So um, this is just looking um, at the at tennis elbow, tendinosis and tendinitis, look at the etiologies of each, and more importantly, just using this as a quick example of how you use reflex inhibition, segmental facilitation, axoplasmic flow problems in looking for etiologies in um, tennis elbow.